one of my neighbors said to me, I can't remember which at the time, oh my God, it's like Alcatraz. <laughs> but I don't think it's like Alcatraz. I, I love it. Uh, I really love it. I think it's a very beautiful piece of architecture. It looks like a 70s science fiction film, really. It's like a family house. Big family house. You know, it's a kind of hill town that's in the middle of Swiss cottage. It's like a concrete village. There's never, not going to be any more, I doubt, built like this. A lot of people would say this is some sort of concrete horror that lurches along the back of a rail track. big up the estate can't you so you could say oh we live in a penthouse apartment in a grade two star listed building in St John's Woods which, which is true. It is a unique building at the time it was built it was one of the most progressive it's a model of its architecture even though the architecture is questionable. I just like living here it's like my mum told us a couple of times she wanted to move out and it's like, oh, against that, so, I don't know, just, there's a good feeling about living here, you know. Pound for pound, this is the most expensive building built by a local council anywhere in the world. Well, Alexandra Road is thought of and generally talked about as a housing scheme. Um, and it is mainly housing. But what it really is, is something beyond that. Alexandra Road is a piece of city. I actually came here with my parents um, when I was about 13. Um, we moved into the um, first phase of the development um, back then. I used to rent at number 3B on Ainsworth Way for about a year and loved the space that I got and decided that if I had an opportunity to buy, I would buy. And then lo and behold, one came up, one came for sale and I bought it. So it's a bit of an adventure. <laughs> I've been here before to visit somebody in a flat years before and thought, what a cool pad. It'd be really nice to live there. And then when I got off at this place, it was great. This'll do. So I set about covering the council grey, horrible tiles and the old man's toilet and made it my own. When I was a kid, it reminded me of uh, holiday homes, strangely, I think because of like everyone had like this garden in front of their, you know, this terrace in front of their uh, flats. It was actually my wife who decided. Uh, she found this place really nice. She said, oh, look, it looks like Greece. Well, I first looked at this estate when I was about 17, just when it had been finished. And I came with a friend and we went to Abbey Road End and looked up when all the original lighting, when it was brand new. And, I mean, I was absolutely awestruck. I just thought it was the most fantastic place. Daunting and frightening when you first walk on, until you get to know the estate. I was quite shocked. I remember walking down Abbey Road, because I'd gone to get the keys up in West Hampstead, and I was looking at the tower blocks and thinking, well, it's probably one of those, and I had no idea where I was going. And I just came over the bridge and saw the estate, and it was a good feeling, but it, it, it felt like something from, you know, almost from another planet. It was... Um scary it was a scary it was it looked so bright and white not like it does now but you, it it just took, took your breath away I just thought it was a really cool space because their flat was empty 
I mean, you could walk around in one big square and there's nothing here, it was very minimalist and it got a balcony. So it looked a lot bigger and I thought this is great. And there's all the lights and the French windows and I like French people. In some ways it felt very much like when I first went, my, went to my first um, Arsenal game at the old stadium and um, I just kind of arrived from, you know, you, you kind of come through some so small terrace streets and then you end up in this kind of amazingly different place of a different scale to anything else around you. It looked like a, a, an enormous concrete crocodile that had been in an accident covered in scaffolding. It was horrendous. Loved it. It's totally different. Never seen anything like it in my life. I felt a little bit like in an aquarium bowl, you know, it's just a fish bowl. I could see my neighbours, my neighbours could see me. Um, but I like the architecture. The idea, as far as we were concerned, was this continuous, high-density, urban scheme which got its vitality from picking up ingredients which go a long way back um, in English housing history, quite distinct from German, French, Italian urban plan, taking that notion of continuity and interpreting that in, with modernism. We had a friend came who, who we thought she was joking when she said, oh, this is reminiscent of the terraces of Bath. Right? And we, you know, she was a, an artist. Um, but it is, it's, it's nice and light, it's less, you know, the alternative really, that sort of horrible, bland, straight council estate. I don't, don't like the thought of that, whereas I don't feel so sort of municipal here really. I feel a bit, it feels like it's different which I like. All right, we're in a state, but it feels like an actual street as opposed to living in a high-rise building. One of the key aspects of the design is that everyone has a connection to the street. And that's through the stairs that come up from the street to people's houses, um, the, the terraces they've got that overlook the street, um, that it feels like one place. It's big and it's quite dense, yet at the same time, it feels quite connected. The design of the architecture is really brutal, it's industrial. This isn't a domestic setting, this is very brutal and very hard, monotone and, 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 and just same, 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 same. So it's boring and the whole linear thing is boring. And I can remember a conversation that we had with the planners who said, but if you turn those upside, those top dwellings around the other way, their terraces will face the, the gardens too. Well, there are two good reasons why we couldn't do that. One, it would mean the building had to be further apart. It would maybe lose de density and we couldn't do it. And the other one was the simple reason I didn't like it. I liked the fact that all the terraces face inwards, all the staircases face inwards, you have an outer wall on one side, you have an outer wall on the other, and you are explaining the nature of the building on its architecture. But you're so close to people that um, you have to get on with them and also y you do get on with them because you are so close and it kind of um, forces you to understand things a little bit more. I certainly can hear my neighbour, my neighbour can hear me and I can uh, see also the neighbours across the road so we to some degree start participating in each other's lives. The estate's very closed in, um, door to door very close together, so you can't really leave your house without bumping into a neighbour. So it does make it a lot easier to get together as a community. They're very close together. I, like, I want it to be more out, so we've got a bit more space. I think it's good because it, it's such a long estate, but it's nice that there's two sides facing one another, so that it's not like you're seeing the back of someone else. You're kind of, it all kind of draws the people together, I think. People are constantly being defensive about the way they treat their space, so they might put up fences or they might put up planting or sort of screen things by putting sort of canopies or all sorts of stuff. So you see sort of a little bit of defensive 
um, design going on. If it was in France, say a nice part of France, people would play boule and um, hang out together and there wouldn't be, you know, beer cans, syringes and lighters and sort of aerosol cans. Could have been designed for people to hang out together within a community and um, it has got those areas, definitely. It just hasn't got the people who are likely to use those areas. We wanted the curve to follow the railway um, and that was quite an achievement. <laughs> And we had the problem of how to do the curve. Well, we were doing concrete walls, and so instead of doing walls that were parallel like that, we did walls that were wedged. If you could choose where to put it, you might not put it beside a railway line, but then the fact is the railway line has probably made the estate what it is. And living here all the years I have, it's a bit like living next to a waterfall. I don't hear the trains. So then it had a street which was like an old-fashioned street, except that it was separated from from vehicles, separate vehicles and pedestrians, which was part of the planning brief in any, and in any case at that scale it seemed to me to be the right thing to do in any case. The only negative part of the design I can think of really is the car parking. Um, the underneath space I think is um, it's just too open to abuse. Putting people driving in bloody hell, it's a nightmare. They can't find you, they get, go up Boundary Road, then there's that rotten sign, they get directed down to the little mini island, and then they say, all I can see is a load of garages, where are you? It's a terrifying entrance for, for drivers. Lots of spaces on railway, and you think, what is the point of that? Um, I used to remember sitting down there, when I shouldn't have been sitting down there, <laughs> smoking on the sly when I was a teenager, not, not a good thing. Um, and they used to have, yeah, there was a lot of little spots in little quiet places that you just thought to yourself, well, do you, why is that there? It's a long horizontal element. And it just seemed kind of dreary and wrong and difficult to handle, simply just cutting it off on that flame of that end wall. It just seemed impulsively nice to stick it out, um, entirely willful, not functional in any way at all. I remember a meeting that we had when we were under construction, the building was there and it was being built and so forth, and it was finished. And the builder was saying at the end, now I know what that is for. It's for the architect to jump off of when the building is finished. <laughs> There's quite a limited number of flats that, that have flat access, which you know, I think it's a shame and it's something that probably wasn't thought of in quite the same way as we do now. Well, it is a stupid idea. Here you have to go the stairs, but then there's a lift. Have you seen it? Mm -hmm. oh, isn't it stupid? It should have been a lift from the bottom. When we were in the one bedroom, with a buggy up three flights of stairs was a bit tricky. Only concrete would do the structure. We couldn't have done it in brick or other load-bearing material. Um, we had to have the concrete cross walls. We then were able to use them for the heating system. Uh, we were able to use them for the wedge, to produce the curve. Um, they were indispensable. The question was whether we made them external. We couldn't, I don't think we could have dealt with the architecture of the trough any other way than by concrete. I love the concrete. I always liked concrete. <laughs> um, not very pretty. I think you either like it or hate it. Very dark and dismal looking. I think it is kind of quite brave and brutal and, you know, we quite love it. It just looks dull. It just looks really dull. I love concrete. <laughs> love it. <laughs> I like it in the sunshine. I hate it in the rain. Again, I sort of think it's, it's, it's quite Mediterranean. I love the concrete. I love the... I don't like it at the moment, the colours. It's not, we've kind of removed, when we cleaned it about 12 years ago, um, we actually removed a sort of patina of the concrete, which in fact it's got dirtier in the, in the last decade. It's not that brilliant. And I've never been a big fan of grey. I like it. However, my, my daughter likes to paint, paint it all over. So she likes it more colourful, not just grey. It ne needs a good clean. Concrete's concrete. I come from Germany and we have a sort of 
I suppose modernist, that's where modernist architecture was really born, Bauhaus. So we have, qu have quite a different attitude to a modernist and concrete architecture. They built wooden boards and tipped those concrete into it, and each board left a different imprint, which is unique. It's like a building's DNA. You know, it's just all different colours. It's not one nice white or grey. It's a mixture of both. Uh, the positive side, uh, I don't think there is a positive side. Um, and I think that the way that it's offset by, by the red brick road and by all the planting that people do on their balconies and all the sort of communal planting that's gone on downstairs really, really softens it as well. If half the people on the estate dressed their balconies and grew something, the whole atmosphere of the building would totally change. So you are surrounded by um, a rather intricate and an always shifting number of shapes and angles um, as you negotiate your way through the estate. state like this needs to be maintained and uh, on a regular basis and just looked after. And was also a product of naivety was that there was a kind of optimism that was not only mine but was shared by other people that the, all of that kind of thing would be properly looked after. At one time we had a housing co-op here and I thought that was one of one of the best times we had in terms of managing this place. I'm not saying Camden didn't manage well in the early days, but once we have rate capping come in and they weren't in control of the exchequer, things start dropping, up. start dropping. Them. It makes me feel quite proud that I should sort of say I live in a grade two star listed building. It makes you kind of, you know, you feel proud of your area, innit? It's just like one step below the Queen, that's something big, isn't it? <laughs> I would have preferred it if it hadn't been needed to be listed, if people had been respecting it. I'm talking about builders, um, planners, uh, the people who were doing the repairs. It's good to maintain, I suppose, it makes the council do things in a certain way. It does make things more expensive, I suppose. You know, it's like Hampton Court is a grade two listed building, but this, you know, Hampton Court gets a lot more care than we do. And we live here and nobody lives at Hampton Court. I have a fantastic balcony. Um, it, it isn't a balcony, it's a haven in the summer and even in the winter I love it. I hate little balconies that just stick out. Mm. They don't feel as if they feel... You have to make the wrong decision to go out. Like I'm going to go out into my balcony. You want the balcony to be like a room that is an extension of the interior. Um, on the other hand, you don't want it to be too enclosed. So the slope of that concrete means that it is both an extension from the room and you can feel an expanse as far as space is concerned. I think it's brilliant. It's south-facing, so you get sun all day long, which is fabulous. I mean, all the people get all the sun all the day long. Designing of a, of a dwelling in a small amount of space is a puzzle. If you get it right, it looks so automatically right that nobody thinks it's being thought about. Um, but it takes a lot to get it as precise as that. It's very hard to believe that, um, that it's built on the same sort of frameworks and the same sort of sizing as, as, as many other council houses. Um, um, and yeah, I think because it's such a generous and, 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 and feels very spacious. It might be a little bit on the small side. And, and if you if you have to get away from each other, you have you probably have to go out.
you know, because you can hear each other breathe effectively. As I said, it's really well laid out. I think the thing that's really clever about it is you don't get like long corridors that are, you know, pointless, you know, that are just connecting room to room, you know. That, that, what, so the circulation areas where, you know, the, the areas, you know, like the hall or the bit between the bedrooms, they're, they're a size that you, and area that you can use for things. So. Plus the fact that if you have a living room upstairs, the noise that you make on your floor is over your own bedrooms. If you have it the other way around, with your living room below, the noise that you make in the living room is over your neighbour's bedrooms. So you're containing that aspect of nuisance more within your own dwelling. Um, I mean, we don't have kids, but if we did, we'd be crowded. And I think that's probably the case for some people on the estate. Um, I mean, I don't think that's a problem with the estate itself. That's probably more to do with the council's housing policy. Um, I can change the change the space around with the sliding doors as well. So it's a good, good space for me to live in. And I have a memo somewhere or other which says uh, this architect appears to have an obsession with sliding doors and the staircases are the very latest thing from habitat design, not suitable for council tenants. He made it so that you, you walk round either way and you never come to a stop. Uh, indeed, there was a small child here not long ago who had a wonderful time running round and round. Because <laughs> it's open space, I think that's good because like, it encourages you to like, sit around together rather than being in separate rooms. Like when my mum was cooking in the kitchen, she's not in a separate room like, locked away cooking to herself. If you've got minimum spaces, you have to make decisions. And those decisions, every time you make one of those decisions, it is a limit. We try to make those decisions which actually allow for as much activity and domestic life and so forth as you possibly can. In terms of the living area, I think, you know, they've done a fantastic job in, in making the most of, of the space here, putting the living space into the living room and into the bedroom. The kitchen and the bathroom, consequently, are, are much smaller. Yeah, I really despise those brown tiles. I just think they're absolutely hideous. But anything else, and to put a washing machine facility within the one bedroom flat. So yeah, if you could change that, that would be perfectly fine. Everyone's a winner. <laughs> um, I would love to have provided enough room in the kitchens for washing machines, but we couldn't do it. Extra plumbing, extra electricity, and above the, the standard. <clears throat> so that's the kind of thing. Then there's a real question as to whether the architect went too far in doing the concrete worktops and the tiling because those are my choice uh, about the feeling of the interior um, and a lot of people would want to rip that out and just do it their own way. So you tell me how far you go with that kind of thing. Um, I think they look quite nice. In a small place you do not want radiators because it gets in the way of the furniture, which can only be arranged in a certain way in a small space. Now, I'm Max Fordham, and I was the heating engineer for Alexander Road and worked with Neve on deciding how the heating should be made to run. And uh, it was actually, Danny Van said, why not put it in the walls? And that's how we went. I think it's a unique and uh, ingenious system um, but it just needs to be kind of brought into the 21st century. But that does not mean that the, 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 the walls, the hot walls, the radiant walls, um, are a bad thing. I think they can be um, uh, retained and improvements made to the rest of the building that um, can improve the overall environmental design. seems never-ending as you approach it. Very early in the morning, it's a beautiful place and the red brick path is gorgeous and the whole the way the estate works and the, the way it looks is great. Well, I think it's beautiful and I, I think it's beautiful the way it's stepped back like this. So you always feel the sky 
you know it never feels shut in ever Oh, it's one of the nicest feelings because you just, you know, you can't help but look around, look up at the sky, look at all the balconies, look at all the planting that people have been doing. And actually there's often loads of kids playing out on it as well, which is nice because you don't often see children playing on London streets. So it kind of takes me back to to my childhood because I grew up in Dublin and we always played out on the street. It's all right apart from the dog shit. And there are other times when it's really hot and sunny, you see um, everybody on their patios, maybe having a drink, having a cup of tea, chatting to friends over their balconies, or even just having a little gathering on their patios. It looks really nice. When you walk through it, and they walk up to the end, you see them amble. There's no getting away, no traffic, lovely. Because I, I, I'm sure I remember going up the estate one day, and it was summer, and I think you lot were out, and if. Correct me if I'm wrong, but have you done Irish dancing? Oh, yeah. Anyway, you and your sisters, or maybe your sisters, I can't remember who, were on, out on the street, and there's you've got friends, or there's kids who live near you, and I think they're Asian kids, and then there were other kids who I think are Somali, so they were really dark, and then the Asian kids are, are brown, and then there were you, kind of, you know, London Irish, I presume, yeah? And you were teaching them how to do Irish dancing. And it was the most, the funniest, br most brilliant thing I've ever seen. It was a real kind of London scene on on the estate. Am, am I right? I haven't made that up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was brilliant. So thanks for that. <laughs> that was a great memory. <laughs> idea being that we needed to integrate playgrounds. We wanted to have a variety of different sorts of spaces. Um, we wanted to be able to walk around it in a variety of different ways. I wanted to make it so that you had close, intimate places where people could sit or chat or talk, and, and more open spaces where children could play. The housing refused to have a flat area because they said children will play football on it and will spoil the grass. Um, they required the four, uh, five playgrounds um, designed as specifically for age groups, which I said this is absurd because the open, a whole open space is a playground. When I was growing up, all the young kids of all different ages all played together. So it was that like, really enjoyable. And we used the whole estate. So we had a that is like I'm having a massive playground. <laughs> it's very clearly an artificial area. It, it's a man-made space from beginning to end, and that's very obvious. Uh, but at the same time, it's a wonderful thing to feel that you're miles away from everywhere. And there's a path that runs the whole length of the, the site um, at the back, or slightly raised, and um, that has native planting in it. I'm very fortunate in actually where I might the position of where my flat is here because I've got the, this fantastic view of the meadow and uh, it's like you know you sit here in the any time in the summer with the big windows and it's like an extension of my garden <laughs> it's really lovely. It was as if the building <coughs> Um, part, which is obviously the living part, the housing, with these great long blocks, with the community centre at the end. In a curious way, they're like a frame to something that you then put in the frame, like a picture. Only, of course, it's active, it's alive, it's got children playing in it, it's got people walking through it, it's got questions of noise, it's got questions of silence, it's got heights of trees, it's got uh, the green, it's got all, the, the, all these things, and then a composition. So it's a composition specific to that particular place. It is very neglected, and 
and it's very sad when you see the neglect and you see um, everything that's been left to decay. Um, a certain beautiful ruinness about it. I, I, I sort of like the fact that it's got this sort of sense of decay and the sense of mystery, which doesn't necessarily appeal with many other people. It's a bit scary. <laughs> Even during the day, I don't like being there. So it's like a sort of furtive um, nest of rats, each little area. It's not the sort of place you walk casually and happily into knowing everything will be fine. A lot of dog mess about, and sometimes you literally cannot avoid them. You've stepped onto them before you can see them, they're just everywhere. There ought to be a commitment to uh, proper maintenance by gardeners and not by um, caretakers. Gardening is something that needs perpetual work on it. The, the estate was designed to be quite community centred, I think, with a number of facilities on the estate that could be used by everyone. And I don't think, or it doesn't seem to me, that they're used anything like enough. The main one that's not used well is the tenant hall, which we are in now. Because it's a, a lovely, big, open space building. It could be used for anything. Tenants hall hasn't been used since I've lived here, eight years, except for um, maybe, I think, mother's meetings and a, a creche once a week and the very occasional yearly sort of get-together that the tenants are invited to, cake and flams and squash. It is well used. Maybe it's not well used. <laughs> I would love Alexander Road to be able to use the social, cultural, activity, mixed resources that were built into it and were part of the architectural idea. Um, but I never lived long, long enough. <laughs> I've got a four, five year old and a ten year old, and they took the play equipment out of the playground, I don't know, four years ago. So there's really nothing for them to do. You have to give them something to do. Because I found that with myself when I was growing up. The only reason I really got in trouble, I wasn't a bad kid or anything, but I got in quite a lot of trouble, is because we had nothing to do, so you'll find anything to get some kind of enjoyment, and normally doing something that you're not supposed to do is quite an exciting thing. One evening I was coming back very late, and I heard footsteps behind me. It was very dark. I was in front of the shops down here towards um, Loudoun Road, and I heard a young man say to his girl, Hurry up and pass this old lady, or she'll think we're going to mug her. Wasn't that sweet? So they shot past me. <laughs> and I think our children here are really fortunate in the fact that they can just be out. It's, it's, you know, we haven't got cars or anything like that. It's just fantastic. And people, you know, if you've got small kids, when I'm when my son was small, you know, you do look out for other people's kids, and it's a sort of, you know, it's an unwritten kind of law in a way. You know what I mean? And I think it's fantastic for families. And it was always quite safe because as, as kids you didn't have to cross a road to go anywhere. Your mum knew that she could just stand out on the balcony and say, Jamila! And you'd be come running back for tea. So, yeah, it was, it was great. It was a great place to grow up. Um, but buildings don't really control people. People react to buildings. What you hope to do is to provide something that people can react positively to. Um, I've lived in the States in the past where where, uh, yeah, you've got a single corridor and you have to go through security grids after every sort of ten, ten, ten flats. And for me that was a very cynical piece of architecture simply because that was almost suggesting that, that the people that were your neighbours were the people that you should be most scared of because there was this whole sort of inner security of a building. Uh, but you don't have this here. We don't have gates at either end of the estate to block it off. And I, think, uh, and I think this goes back to my first sort of experience of the estate itself, was with this self-surveillance that seems to sort of exist within it. And it seems kind of ominous, uh, an expression, but it's also very benign. It's, it's something that basically is that people are just basically looking over each other, but also maybe after each other. I mean, we're having lots of problems with the, um, with, the, with the young guys coming on and causing trouble. It meant that it was easy for them to get away from the police because, you know, 
they knew where everything was and the police didn't. I don't think filmmakers necessarily know why they choose this place. I think there's, some, there's a kind of confusion in some ways because it, on the one hand they use it to represent an image of social housing that is negative, that is full of cr criminality and decay. On the other hand, why do they keep choosing this place in particular? I think because it's an incredibly striking building. What always makes me laugh is that the fact that when they come on the estate to make those sorts of films and they perhaps portray the estate in a bit of a negative light, they're always having to do things like strew rubbish around everywhere to make it look awful, you know, throw a few mattresses around. It's quite funny actually because me and my mum were watching a, an old episode of, I think, The Sweeney and um, they were filming on Rowley but they were filming as it was actually being built there was like scaffolding and stuff it was quite weird so it was just probably after that time that we moved in. Are you therefore all going to look like that one over there? No it's going to look like this. This. Um, there was a Spanish family living here on one summer evening they all went outside on the balcony and they were all playing real music and singing and it was lovely. It was absolutely lovely. And it was a Sunday afternoon, it was quite warm and balmy, everybody had their windows open and I just sat outside and I thought, why, how amazing. So many different, so many different cultures of music were kind of floating in the air. I thought, wow. How fantastic is this? It's like, it's all here. Don't leave. Good lad. <laughs> <laughs>